Welcome to the Illustrator Studio. I am Jesse Kowalski, Curator of Exhibitions at the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. The Illustrator Studio is a weekly interview series, a project of the museum's Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies. I'm delighted to introduce you to Arthur Schick, who was a Polish-Jewish uh, artist born in Łódź, Poland in 1894, in the same year as Norman Rockwell was born. And Arthur Schick came to America in 1940 as an immigrant and died 1951. When he ultimately arrived in America in 1940, uh, he saw himself as a one-man army uh, in his fight against Hitler. Um, he also considered himself to be FDR's soldier in art as he signed uh, a few of his works and became very famous in America, even though uh, many people have forgotten who he was, what he accomplished during his lifetime, but he was as famous as famous could be. And to give you an idea of that, Norman Rockwell was illustrating in the early 1940s the covers of the Saturday Evening Post. At that time, Arthur Schick was illustrating the covers of Collier's magazine. What was the circulation of the Saturday Evening Post? About three million people got each copy. How many people received uh, each copy of Collier's? Two and a half million. So that vir meant that virtually everyone who was seeing Rockwell's art uh, in the early 40s was also seeing that of Arthur Schick. Uh, Schick went to work as an artist uh, diligently for many magazines and newspapers uh, in the early 40s. Uh, his work was uh, also seen in the uh, American uh, Mercury magazine. It was also seen in the New York Post in the Chicago Sun for which he was syndicated and his art also appeared at over 500 USO recreation centers. So virtually every GI who was going overseas was seeing Arthur Schick's artwork. And uh, Schick uh, in 1942 had indicated that he had created already a thousand works of art that dealt with fighting against the uh, Axis, against Hitler since he had started his work um, anti-Nazi art in the 1930s. Eleanor Roosevelt would write about Arthur Schick in her column, My Day, uh, saying about Schick that, that he was fighting as a fighting artist just as if anyone who was on the, on the fighting fronts uh, today. So this uh, gives us some idea of who Arthur Schick um, was within the context of, uh, of uh, World War II. In his early days, he was, uh, as a teenager, uh, growing up in Poland, uh, Schick went off to Paris in 1910, where he studied at the Academy Julien. At the time, he was in Paris for about three and a half, four years. Uh, he would send uh, political caricatures and cartoons, uh, critiquing uh, daily life, uh, commenting on the ills of society, and he would send these back uh, to, to, mag to newspapers in Poland. So already from the early days, Schick was a social activist uh, through his art. Later in 1914, he traveled to Palestine for the first time, uh, was conscripted into the Russian army, fought uh, uh, briefly uh, uh, during World War I, but uh, shortly thereafter, uh, when the war was over and uh, Poland was at war with the Soviet Union, Arthur Schick became the director of art propaganda for Poland in its war against the Soviet Union. And then Schick set out to illustrate many beautiful books that were published, some of the most expensive books in Paris in the 20s were illustrated by, by Schick, um, and he completed a, a, a numerous, numerous works then. His travels then took him uh, to London, ultimately in 1930 where Schick worked on his uh, magnum opus uh, within Jewish tradition, that is the Passover Haggadah. It was published in London in 1940. It was the most expensive new book in the entire world. Each copy of that book sold for $500, which is some people could buy a house uh, at that time in 1940 for that amount of money. And uh, then Schick came to America again in 1940. But this gives you some of his background uh, in Europe. 
he didn't do preliminary drawings. That's the amazing thing. So if you look at the detail, he took the piece of paper or the board and he went to work. Now, I, I once had in my possession all of his uh, sketches and doodles that he had done, several hundred of them, and you can see that he's working different things out. But, but there was no real full-blown sketch or drawing of anything. He would create often a pencil underdrawing and then go to work. But quite often you don't see the pencil underdrawing. And he would w work off into the edge of the page and you would think, oh, he cut this off? No, it was intended to be that way. Uh, when he sat down to work, he didn't use a magnifying glass. I mean, I've spoken to members of his family, people who watched him work, no one uh, ever indicated that he used a magnifying glass except um, Schick once shared with him that he kept one near his desk and that was for everyone else to use uh, when they would come by. Um, he was very nearsighted, uh, he had a few pairs of glasses, um, and he worked very rapidly. He, uh, even the most complex works of art of his um, could take him a week or, or less. And, and when you look at them, it's really hard to believe, but I still don't understand how he worked and how he did what he did. It begins with Arthur Schick creating a series entitled Washington and His Times. These are 38 paintings dealing with uh, George Washington and the American Revolution. Arthur Schick completed those works in 1930. It was published as a portfolio in 1932. In 1935, uh, uh, Arthur Schick was exhibiting these works and they were purchased by the president of Poland, Moschitsky. And in 1935, he presented these to Franklin Roosevelt as a gift, in a way to create closer relations between uh, Poland and the United States on the virtually on the eve of World War II. The Nazis had been in power already. The National Socialists had been in power already for two years. And when Roosevelt gave his uh, Four Freedom speech in January of 1941, uh, 38 paintings of freedom were hanging in the White House, and these were works by Arthur Schick. Then Schick set out, actually in 1942, uh, to illustrate the Four Freedoms. Uh, they were it really featured a, a medieval knight almost fighting for freedom, that, meaning all the freedoms had to be fought for. And Schick's way was uh, to use a medieval knight who would have a, a lance, a, a dagger, a sword, almost accompanying almost each one of them. And uh, these were reproduced uh, in two formats. Uh, one as uh, poster stamps that were widely distributed as if one would distribute Easter seals. And secondly, they were reproduced as enlarged postcards and, and also distributed. This was Arthur Schick's uh, connection uh, to the Four Freedoms, both in terms of his artwork being in the White House when the speech was given, and then also literally to reproduce them as well. So Arthur Schick in his artwork combines many styles, but one of which he's clearly drawn to is that of medieval illuminated manuscripts. And, and in fact, in Paris uh, in the 1920s, it was said of Schick that he was the greatest illuminator in the style of the 16th century uh, miniaturists. But what does it mean to be an illuminator? To be an illuminator means to take a text and to create illustrations around it that illuminate the text, that, that, that bring light to it, that shed light on, on what uh, the text wants you to understand. Uh, Schick was very literal in his art. He was very a realist. And so the, the, the style of uh, illuminated manuscripts l uh, uh, lended itself quite well to what Schick wanted to do because he always believed that art is not my uh, aim, it's my means. So he wanted to deliver a message, and I think that this, the, 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 the intricacy of, of detail and, and, and paying attention to the, the, something very exact could help him deliver the exact message he wanted to. And his art was almost always used to fight against evil and oppression and bigotry and racism and for dignity and for freedom. Uh, we're here uh, in the gallery at the New York Historical Society, uh, and I'm standing in front of the historic poker game. This work turned out to be the first cover that Schick had done for Collier's Magazine that appeared in November of 1941, even though this piece is dated September 1941. And Schick, by the way, almost always never put the month when he created a work of art, but we do see it on some of them. And what is going on in the historic poker game? It turns out, uh, for you World War II history buffs, that uh, you know when World War 
uh, two began. Germany and, uh, and Russia invaded Poland in, 19, in September of 1939. But in January of 1941, Hitler decided to invade the Soviet Union. So now all bets are off, and Schick sees this standoff between Germany and Russia as a historic poker game. So what we're really looking at here is Hitler is playing poker against Ivan of Russia. Now, why is he called Ivan? Because in America, we call America Uncle Sam, and in England, we refer to England often as John Bull. This is Ivan of Russia. Now, Hitler is holding three cards in his hand. Who are those three cards? These are jokers. It's Mussolini of Italy, uh, Pitana of the Vichy French, and Hirohito of Japan. And who is Ivan holding in his hand? He's holding a pair of aces. Who's the aces? America and Great Britain. Now, if you've ever played poker or you haven't played poker, you would know the three of a kind always beats two of a kind. So Hitler really should be defeating the Russian. But for Schick, he's put more money, a stack of money, more in front of the Russian who holds the pair than he puts in front of Hitler. And that is because Schick is betting on the Russian. Now, America at the time sending gold and, mil and, uh, and, fi and, and, and materials allies to uh, to Great Britain and to and to Russia so Schick is betting on the Russian and the reason he's doing that is because Hitler's holding three jokers these are wild cards and no one knows what wild cards are going to do but a pair of aces you can always count on them so Schick is betting in this historic poker game uh, on the Allies, even though America is not in the war in September of 1941, because it's only a few months later in December we enter the war. But meanwhile, death is looking on. Um, his, his clothes are untattered, unlike Hitler's, whose, whose boots and whose, whose, whose butt are, have, a, have a, uh, a patch on it. But death is sterling, because death is going to win no matter who comes out on top in this poker game. And here you see puppets, the acolytes that of, 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 uh, who are part of the, of the axis that Hitler's pulling along. And uh, in November, this appears as the first Collier's cover. And there's an insert into Collier's, by the way, a broadsheet that's put in there where Schick talks about here how he's an immigrant, how it's a privilege. He says, you don't know what a privilege it is for an immigrant such as me to have my work shown um, um, on the cover of Collier's that I know this work personally because my own son is now fighting somewhere in, Euro in Europe for de Gaulle and this war is personal to me and, uh, um, and you can see that uh, how honored he is uh, for his work um, to be shown to the American public. So I'm standing in front of uh, Arthur Schick's cover for Collier's magazine, Arsenal of Democracy, and this was the Labor Day cover that appeared exactly 75 years ago on the cover of Collier's. And what you see in this work of art is the Nazi serpent who's strangling the pillars of democracy um, here, while Schick is motivating the American workers to take up the, the, the sword of freedom, the sword of democracy, encapsulating uh, Roosevelt's arsenal of democracy talk of December of 1940, where American industry would actually work together in common cause to fight a common enemy and here is Schick's art uh, where he is uh, called upon to create uh, this Collier's cover previously uh, his first work on Collier's appeared um, in November of 1941 it was his first cover and then in January of 42 uh, this work appeared um, in September of 1942 but you'll see the Statue of Liberty here um, you'll see I think this is the Brooklyn Navy Yard um, that's in the background and in the sword you'll see uh, even democracy and I've watched I've seen people looking at this work even with a magnifying glass and they can't see the word democracy there. That's how tiny it is, but uh, it's a brilliant work of art. And uh, again, this was this appeared at the time that uh, uh, Norman Rockwell was illustrating the Saturday Evening Post covers. He was a hater of hate. No one hated hatred more than Arthur Schick did. And on the other side was a man who was a short man, who was bald, who was the life of the party. He would sing, he would sing in numerous languages. Whenever people would gather, he had the spirit of great humor. He was very, a very social man, uh, humorous, fun, loved his grandchildren. In fact, he once illustrated, he illustrated Anderson's fairy tales uh, among the political works and the Judaic works that he did, also illustrated many children's books and many classics. 
and the inscription on the front uh, cover of the uh, Anderson's Fairy Tales, Arthur Schick dedicated this to his granddaughter, and he said that th she is the only dictatorship I will ever accept. Following the war, Schick uh, turned to a great deal of Americana, uh, turned to attacking uh, even racism in America. Actually, he had begun to do that in, in the uh, early 40s uh, when he created artwork, uh, seeing that America was fighting racism abroad. Schick also felt that America wasn't taking care of business at home. And so there are famous works of a white soldier, black soldier walking side by side. The white soldier says to the black soldier, what would you do with Hitler? The black soldier responds, I would make him a Negro and drop him somewhere in the USA. And that's how bad racism was, was here, and Schick was willing to attack that. So here you have an artist who is multifaceted, uh, not limiting his artwork to one specific area of society or one country, but really willing to take a stand wherever he thought injustice was, was, uh, uh, was raising its, uh, its evil head. He, his work was, um, I think, they gave him free license to create what he wished to do. I mean, many of his uh, works were appearing in, uh, in, in left-wing, at that time, left-wing uh, journals, and, and they would be in PM, they would be in the, in the New York Post, they would be in Esquire magazine, um, they would be on the covers of cars. In other words, Schick's artwork was fitting the, the place that was willing to publish his art. Now, of course, he would create artworks also that would attack racism, and some people weren't going to be publishing it, but he created an amazing piece that's even after the, the war's over in 1949, and um, where he's attacking uh, lynching in America, and, and, and it is a great piece of a, of, a, of a black soldier, a hero during World War II, um, who is uh, wearing a, a purple heart, a cross around his neck, and his, his hands are tied behind him, and standing over uh, his shoulder are two members of the Ku Klux Klan. And Schick's caption on this piece is, he, he takes the a caption from the book of Luke and he flips it on his head, and Schick's words are, do not forgive them, O Lord, for they know what they do. And that work of art was published in a, in a newspaper called The Compass. I think it was the Sunday Compass in 1949. And Schick uh, would take the strongest of stands and his work would be published. So I think that was the kind of man he was, that was the convincing man he was, and that was the, the attention that he paid to issues that he thought were the right issues to be addressed in the manner in which he addressed them. It turns out that in 1949, sweeping across America was this uh, fear of communism, um, the House on Un-American Activities led by Senator Joseph McCarthy was, was formed, and Schick, together with other great writers and playwrights and artists, were all investigated by the House on Un-American Activities. Uh, this had to tear Schick apart because you have to understand that he came here to the land of his ideals. What was Schick's response to being investigated by the House on Un-American Activities? It was then in 1949 and 50 that he created his greatest Americana. And one of those works of art uh, was the Four Freedoms Prayer. In it, we have a prayer and uh, it's all written by hand in, in calligraphy and Schick always created both the art and he was also the scribe, so he created both. Uh, this is a prayer that's uh, ascribed quite often to Thomas Jefferson. We're not quite sure of its origins, but this is a, a national prayer for freedom uh, that is on the left-hand side of this image. And then around the borders of the illumination itself are the four freedoms um, that go around the border. And in the center of it, you'll find uh, the Virgin Mary holding Jesus as if to indicate the birth of the nation. And together with them, you'll find the black man and the Jew and the Anglo-Saxon uh, Protestant who's there. All three men, all three individuals are bringing the gifts uh, to the new nation that's to be born of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so what Schick has tried to do is to bring to life the greatness of America through these, this Four Freedoms prayer. The idea that someone can discover who Arthur Schick is, to, to, to learn of, a, of, a, of, a, of an advocate for, for his own people, uh, to learn how one can use their value system in caring about their own people to be an advocate for humanity at large. Uh, this to me is the genius of Arthur Schick. Um, I think what he's really saying is that no matter what your tradition is, whether you're a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew, use the work for your own people, but use the best of that tradition to help 
you know, make the world a better place. I mean, I think that's who Arthur Schick is. I think his message is directed to each of us. I think he tried to show it during his lifetime, and I, that's why I believe that his art really, while it addressed issues of its own day, were really uh, issues that are really issues for all time. And uh, I think in Schick, we, we do find an artist uh, uh, for all time.